Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Sunday, July 10th, 2022, and today we are going to be talking about the Maryland governor's election this November and a proxy war that has started between President Donald Trump and Republican Governor Larry Hogan, the incumbent governor from the state of Maryland. Now, to give you a bit of background on the state of Maryland, it is a very overwhelmingly blue state. In the last presidential election, Maryland voted for President uh, Biden by a margin of 33 percentage points. Even in 2016, when Hillary Clinton lost the presidential election, Maryland went to her by 26 points. Obama won it. Uh, Kerry had won it. Gore had won it. Clinton had won it again. The last time Maryland had gone red was by 2.9% in 1988 with George H.W. Bush against Michael Dukakis. That margin of victory was 2.9%. It was very narrow. Ronald Reagan did win the state, but pretty much Maryland has been a blue state ever since. But then 2014 happened, and the state itself voted to vote in a Republican for governor in a midterm that was so beneficial for the GOP and so detrimental to the, Repu to the Democratic Party. Anthony Brown was an incumbent U.S. representative at the time, now again a U.S. representative now running for attorney general in the state. He was the Democratic nominee for governor. Then there was Larry Hogan, who had served in the state but was never an official U.S. representative, though his father was, so the name might ring a bell for some people who lived in the area or recognized the Hogan last name. But Larry Hogan ultimately ended up as the GOP nominee for governor, but came across as someone who was in the center. He wasn't one of the more extreme Republican nominees, and at the time, President Trump hadn't been as involved in politics as, of course, he is today. So there was no narrative against the GOP in some of these more solid blue states that there was this extremist and right-wing ideology associated with President Trump and every other Republican. Of course, they did have conservatism, right-wing uh, ism, if you want to call it that, attached to the GOP, but it wasn't nearly as extreme as it is viewed today amongst some of these more safe blue voters. But in 2018, Larry Hogan defied expectations and actually won in a blue wave year, won re-election. Now, it made sense. He was a very popular governor in a very solid blue state, but... That popularity narrowed down into about a 10-point, 12-point victory. Now, the margin of victory is very impressive for a Republican, but Larry Hogan at this point in time, despite winning by 12 points, had an approval rating significantly higher, plus 30, plus 40 in some polls. He was polling sometimes in the low 70s, high 60s. So keeping that in mind, many voters here approved of Larry Hogan, yet still voted for his opponent simply because they couldn't bring themselves to vote for a Republican. Now, that is important because what we see now happening in the Republican primary is a proxy war between between Trump and Hogan. An electable Republican and a non-electable Republican are on the ballot and they are facing off against each other. But there's a lot more in it than just simply an electable Republican and a non-electable Republican. What you also find is that this is going to really rile up the base within Maryland to see and give a true test towards President Trump and his allies about whether or not a moderate, more center Republican can still defeat someone who is endorsed by President Trump. And as we have seen in a couple of elections recently, as Larry Hogan does say, Donald Trump's influence is diminishing. Not all of Donald Trump's endorsees do win their primaries. And some of these primaries, they lose with 20% of the vote, 30% of the vote. When things like that happen, it looks very negatively for President Trump. And he has been putting in a lot of weight putting in a lot of say into the state of Maryland, more specifically attacking Larry Hogan and propping up his choice, Donald Trump's choice, Dan Cox, the state delegate for the 4th District, first elected in 2018 and ran for Congress in 2016, and now is, in some people's eyes, the front runner for governor. His main opponent, Kelly Schultz, former Maryland Sec Secretary of Commerce, former Maryland Secretary of Labor, and served in the Maryland House of Delegates. Now, don't get me wrong. These two people are both Republicans. Either of them, if they were to head to the general election, probably would lose because Larry Hogan was popular and won in the most beneficial year for the GOP that we had seen in quite some time. I can't say 2022 is expected to be that, especially with a new revitalized focus on governorships following the Dobbs decision. In 2014, it didn't matter if there was a pro-life governor because, one, there weren't votes there for them to even choose pro-life uh, legislation to get through onto the governor's desk, and two, because Roe v. Wade had been tried and tested and wasn't really within this vulnerable position in a 5-4 to four court. Now that it was vulner uh, vulnerable and was overturned by a 6-3 to three court, Democrats in safe blue states are very less likely to vote for a Republican, even if they're more moderate uh, when it comes down to statewide elected positions, especially governorships, where a governor's veto could be as popular, uh, sorry, as powerful as a state legislature. But regardless, though, what we find here is that Kelly Schultz is the Hogan-endorsed candidate. 
She is endorsed by the one guy who was able to get away from the safe blue uh, characterization that Maryland had held for a long period of time. Now, this Maryland election came as a surprise to some people. Looking at the predictions here, you had it lean D, tilt D, then you had two toss-ups. But almost all of the polls, despite one right before the election, showed Anthony Brown defeating Larry Hogan. And in some cases, by some pretty substantial amounts. He was up by 13 points in a poll two weeks before the election. Sure, the other ones were not so, lar- uh, not so much uh, of a large lead. Two points, one point, three points, six points, seven points. But that 12-point lead definitely probably gave Anthony Brown uh, this false sense of security. It was done by CBS News, YouGov, and the New York Times, a poll that many people today would very easily trust, that it was off by such a substantial amount. Larry Hogan didn't exactly win by this landslide margin of victory in 2014. He did narrowly win the race by less than four points. But keep in mind, he's winning in a state that Obama had won by over 25 in two years prior in the 2012 election. So Larry Hogan definitely has something to be said about his electability and his ability to win in the state of Maryland as a Republican. He individually might be a strong candidate if you throw him into a swing district or a swing race, but you also have to recognize that it was not only a swing district or a swing race, but an entire state that is so solidly blue. So his endorsement is definitely holding a lot of weight with Kelly Schultz in this Republican primary. Voters see her as the viable option for the GOP. Republicans that don't agree with that see Dan Cox as the more Make America Great Again candidate, the more Trumpy candidate, and someone that they believe they can rely on. Donald Trump has called both Larry Hogan and Kelly Schultz rhinos, Republicans in name only, meaning that they aren't actual Republicans and that they just affiliate as such. Now, obviously, that's just not true. Kelly Schultz has had a very strong conservative record since she started in the House of Delegates. She has had the same policy stances for quite some time and did slightly adjust towards the center. But if you compare her to any of the other Democrats that are deciding to run for governor, what you find is that all of them are much more left wing than her because she is, truly speaking, right wing. Donald Trump isn't correct in his assessment that she is a rhino because she holds nearly identical policy platform points as Dan Cox. The only difference is who endorsed them. And that's why you start to see a difference. And right now, there seems to be a bit of contention as to who is going to win this nomination. Even the political betting markets can't agree as to who is ahead because it is very close. It doesn't really come down to this point of Trump's endorsement mattering more, Hogan's endorsement mattering more. It comes down to a point where now they are put on this equal level, and it's down to the candidates to win their races. Now, the state of Maryland did overwhelmingly vote for Trump in the 2016 presidential primary, but as Hogan has said, that influence is diminishing. In the state of Maryland, though, in a poll for 2024, if we can go ahead and get around this paywall, which we probably cannot, it says here that Trump leads Hogan by a two-to-one margin amongst GOP voters in a potential 2024 matchup. I can just go ahead and show you that poll. I don't know why I needed to show you uh, an article from the Baltimore Sun, but I decided to do so. But it's a two-to-one margin. Yet for some reason, in the exact similar race, where sure, you're taking away Trump's name, you're taking away Hogan's name in a race where practically this is what we call a proxy war. So they're facing off against each other without directly being involved in the race. For some reason, it's still exceptionally close. It's not just the political betting markets, but it's also the polls. We don't have an accurate indication of who's ahead. Now, there was one poll that was done in May of 2022 that showed Dan Cox with 76% of the vote. I don't know where they got that number. Maybe it was a primer leading up to the question saying Dan Cox had been endorsed by Trump and Hogan had not endorsed yet or whatever it might be. But Kelly Schultz and Dan Cox in every other poll have been in somewhat of a competitive race. In the most two recent polls, one shows Kelly Schultz ahead, the other shows Dan Cox ahead, both of them within single digits of each other. The Trump endorsement I don't think matters as much as we might think in Maryland, but it does say something about whether or not Trump's influence can really pour out into some of these other states. We know this decision for President Trump to endorse Dan Cox wasn't exactly the smartest choice. Dan Cox himself even calling on the impeachment of Governor Hogan. Keep in mind, Governor Hogan still remains as a top 10 most popular governor in the United States with an approval rating hovering in the high 60s. So of course his endorsement does matter, but amongst Republican Party voters, Donald Trump is uh, also a very popular figure, and Larry Hogan's approval rating isn't as high as you might expect. Similar to Governor Charlie Baker in the state of Massachusetts, Larry Hogan's approval rating is upheld by Democrats and independents, not so much by Republicans for what you might expect. So looking at that Trump endorsement, it matters equally as much as Hogan's, because Trump's relevancy and Trump's influence on the primary has diminished since the 2020 election, since the 2016 election, and Larry Hogan's also has diminished, but he also still has some 
level of uh, you know recognition to his name, uh, moving behind his name. Hogan is this one Republican who was able to defy expectations. So if he's endorsing another candidate, voters may be inclined to vote for them, even general election voters. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But this proxy war that has sort of jumped up in the state of Maryland is going to be quite fascinating. Because while the primary poll for 2024 might say Donald Trump leads Larry Hogan 48 to 25, I truly want to know if this would diminish in a year's time, given an indication from this upcoming primary. The primary is right around the corner in the state of Maryland, and we will see the first real test in Maryland and in some of these safe blue states for a Trump-endorsed candidate versus a Hogan or more moderate Republican-endorsed candidate, because it does matter. It isn't just a case of uh, gauging the Republican electorate, gauging the 2024 primary, but also electability. Take a look at the ratings in the state of uh, Maryland right now for the general election. Despite it being a state that Joe Biden won by 33, the narrowest uh, rating is a lean D, and the largest is likely D. None of them have this as a safe D state. Now, I do, because I think Dan Cox has a realistic chance at the primary, and should he win it, it's automatically going to safety. And I think that will be the case with Larry Sabato's crystal ball, with Real Clear Politics, with the Cook Political Report. I think many of them will come forward and say Dan Cox was the wrong nominee for governor in the state of Maryland, and they'd be absolutely correct. Because taking a Trump-endorsed Make America Great Again Republican and propping them up on a governor ballot, even in a red wave year, wouldn't win you the election. Larry Hogan's candidate, on the other hand, is someone who has been pushed away by President Trump, someone who Republican voters on the more moderate centrist spectrum have started to elevate. And should she win the nomination, I think Maryland's governor race might be surprisingly competitive. I still think Democrats would win it, absolutely, but I don't think it would be this 33-point margin of victory that we might be able to expect should Dan Cox become the nominee. The electability case is very important. Because Kelly Schultz is realistically the only Republican that can win in the state of Maryland. It reminds me a lot of what we saw happen in the state of Massachusetts. Similar to the way that Kelly Schultz, despite being the most electable Republican, was shut out and is currently being shut out by the Make America Great Again, the MAGA wing, the right wing part of the Republican Party, is the same, is the same thing that happened to Governor Charlie Baker in the state of Massachusetts. This is the rating report from the Cook Political Report on October 5th, 2021. In the solid R column here, you had the state of Massachusetts. Now, to remind you, Massachusetts voted for Biden just as much as Maryland did. It was off by 0.3. But Maryland and Massachusetts also shared the same thing, a Republican governor who was popular. I told you that Larry Hogan had an approval rating in the high 60s, but so does Governor Charlie Baker in the state of Massachusetts. But the only major difference here between these two races is that Larry Hogan is term limited and Charlie Baker is not. But despite not being term limited, Charlie Baker decided against running for re-election. And you might be thinking, okay, well, if he narrowly won in 2018, maybe he decided not to run simply because it didn't make sense. Maybe he wouldn't win in a new polarized fashion. But it wasn't a narrow victory in 2018. Despite 2018 being an overwhelming Democratic wave year, they won this slate of states, 51 to 48. Massachusetts voted for the Republican Charlie Baker by 33.5. 33.5%. Charlie Baker got 67% of the vote in 2018. Joe Biden got 66% in 2020. Baker landslided against the Democratic Party in 2018 and was all set up for re-election, as described by the Cook Political Report. But Donald Trump went against him, and the Republican primary polling numbers were not favorable for Governor Baker, despite him being one of the most popular governors in the United States, number one for two, three years straight. The Republican Party said no, called him a rhino, shut him out and said, you are not make America great en enough for us. And you know what happened in the most recent rankings? You can see now following that decision to remove himself from the ballot, Charlie Baker has turned Massachusetts from what was a pretty solid state for the Republican Party, solid R in that characterization, to a likely D state. It isn't to blame Charlie Baker. The only people to blame are President Trump and the Republican Party of Massachusetts for calling him a rhino, for attacking him, for propping up a candidate that isn't him, because they just lost a governorship because they simply wanted a more right-wing candidate. And that's exactly what's happening in the state of Maryland right now. Kelly Schultz is this electable Republican. I don't think that she would win easily. I think it would take the wrong Democratic nominee and her as the right GOP nominee. But if she loses this primary, it's a solid, absolute no 
for the GOP at a chance of victory at Maryland's governorship. This is not a swing state. This is a Biden plus 30 state. And the only person who has been able to win here in the past 10 years as a Republican statewide in any notable position is Governor Larry Hogan. And he has made his choice clear, but so has President Trump. And now they are fighting to see whether or not Hogan's influence as the governor is more important than the former president. And this will be setting up a matchup that we could expect to see in 2024 of Hogan and Trump in a 2024 Republican primary. We know that Trump will probably win that 2024 primary. Hogan realistically only has recognition in Maryland and surrounding states, and then somewhat on the national level, but realistically not so much. His national numbers are nowhere near this 25% that he's getting in the state of Maryland. And it also does say something that as the incumbent governor is only getting 25% in his home state, but things can change. And as Trump has said, uh, as Biden, sorry, as Hogan has said correctly, Trump's influence is diminishing. This primary for the state of Maryland occurs on July 19th. We will see what happens. If the Republicans do end up with Dan Cox as the nominee, safe blue. With Kelly Schultz, lean blue, likely blue. Narrowing up, I still think the Democrats would win because I think they will nominate a strong candidate. They have some very strong potential nominees. But there is a way for this to go wrong for the Democratic Party, just as it did in 2014. So keep your eye out on this Republican primary. Keep your eye out on whether or not Trump's influence or Hogan's influence will matter a lot more. As we have seen in some of these states, the incumbent governor or incumbent senator or incumbent representative's endorsement matters more than the endorsement of the former president. And that's really jeopardizing his stake and claim to 2024 if these nominees do end up winning the general election. The people that he called unelectable end up winning the general election. The people that he said were rhinos end up winning the general election. And then he doesn't have many friends in Congress or Senate or governorships that he can rely on for their support in 2024, meaning it makes him more of a vulnerable candidate for that 2024 nomination. I honestly think Donald Trump has really been trying to get rid of all the people who could openly oppose him, even if that means that they're most electable, because it helps him for 2024. The less opposition in leadership means the more support you have from your own internal supporters. If you only endorse in safe states and you only get in uh, safe primaries and you get people to win, you end up putting yourself in a position where you are setting yourself up for success in 2024 or any future election that you decide to run in. I think that's exactly what Donald Trump, is in do Donald Trump is doing. But we will see what happens. I'm not sure how this governor election is going to go. I think there are, very two, uh, there are two very different outcomes depending on who the Republican nominee is, but we will talk about that following the conclusion of the July 19th primary. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server that you can go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 governor election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.